Well, at least I'm home. I can follow my intellectual pursuits. I offer records! Covered in bubble gum! My collection of rare, incurable diseases! Violated! No! My dinosaur dropping! Painted like Easter eggs! Hobo Radio, the official podcast of HoboTrashCan.com. Brought to you by the Podcast Network. You can share your thoughts on the show anytime by emailing Joel at Murphy's Law at HoboTrashCan.com. Giddy up, giddy up, a giddy up, a ride that funky pony. A giddy up, a giddy up, a ride that funky pony. A giddy up, a giddy up, a ride that funky pony. A giddy up, a giddy up, a ride that funky pony. And now, two guys with worse jokes than me, Joel Murphy and Lars. <laughs> I'm Joel Murphy, this is Hobo Radio, and this week we bring to you something very special, uh, our interview with John Kay, creator of Ren and Stimpy and George Licker. Uh, I bring you that interview in its entirety. Uh, he's currently doing a Kickstarter campaign to fund an all-new George Licker cartoon called Cans Without Labels. Uh, if you want to support that, you can find all the details out on our website, hobotrashcan.com. Uh, where you can also find a print version of this interview. Uh, so go ahead and check that out, and I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you enjoy this version, and also the song at the end, which is Liquor to Liker by Peter Slagle and True South. The first question I wanted to ask you, um, how did you get into animation? Like, when did it become an interest for you? Oh, well, professionally or just an interest? Uh, well, just an interest first and then professionally. Well, it started when I was a little kid, the first time I ever saw a cartoon. That's what I wanted to do. And so then how did that interest turn into, I want to do this for a career? Well, I started drawing, and uh, I used to um, I used to draw the cartoon characters that I, you know, I saw in the movies and on TV and stuff. And then I started writing stories about... Um, other people's characters, and particularly, uh, I used to um, I used to draw like Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear and the Flintstones. Quick draw McGraw, the early Hanna Barbera cartoons were the first characters that I learned to draw, and I used to make my own comics and stories about them. But it took me longer to figure out what made them move. That, I, at first, I thought that was magic. I figured that was like witchcraft or something. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how good you got at drawing the characters, they just didn't start moving on the page, and I couldn't figure out like what the hell's going on. And uh, when I saw cartoons, I just assumed that that was proof of magic, because there was no scientific explanation for how drawings could move. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when did you actually start learning about animation? Uh, well, the first time I actually figured it out was um, my dad bought me a um, a uh, Huckleberry Hound. Uh, uh, it's hard to explain. 
but there was a big box in a store that said Huckleberry Hound, make your own flip books. And I, I didn't know what a flip book was. So I got him to buy it. I took it home and opened the box and pulled out all these long strips of cardboard. And uh, on the strips were individual drawings of Huckleberry Hound or Yogi Bear or whoever, all very slightly different. Each drawing was a little bit different than the previous one. I was like, whoa, this is weird. And uh, I read the instructions and it said, cut the pictures apart, lay them on top of each other, pinch the top, and then flip them. Flip them. So I did that. I thought that was crazy. I was like, what? <laughs> what a weird thing to do, cut up all these pictures. But I did it and I flipped it and I just freaked out. <laughs> like all the, you know, I let go of the pictures and they flew all over the floor. I was like, Eureka! <laughs> So that's what makes it move. It isn't witchcraft. It is scientifically possible. So, so from that day on, I was an atheist. <laughs> uh, did, did you go to school for animation, or, or how did you start pursuing a career? Well, I, you know, I did tons of my own flip books and stuff once I figured out how it worked. And then I went to Sheridan College for about a year and one semester. But they didn't really teach anything at the school. So I came down to Hollywood and got a job. What was your first job? My first job was for Calico Creations. It was a small commercial studio. And uh, that was actually a pretty good job because um, when you're working in a small studio like that, you you learn how everything fits together because they give you jobs doing everything, you know, like intern jobs in the beginning, Xeroxing, uh, painting cells, shooting camera, just whatever whatever is needed on a particular project, they'll give you to, they'll give you to do. So you, you see how each of those jobs fits together, and it, it all makes sense to you. So that's a great way to start, actually. It was like a, an apprenticeship. And then later, uh, after a few months of that, Eddie Fitzgerald talked me into uh, going over to Filmation, who he said was uh, experiencing a gold mage. And I thought that was crazy. Like, Filmation was the worst studio that ever existed <laughs> at that time. And uh, I thought, well, you know, what I really wanted to do was entertainment cartoons, right? not commercials so much. Uh, and Filmation is the last studio I would ever think of as entertainment. But they were doing a series of uh, Mighty Mouse cartoons and Heckle and Jekyll. And I loved Mighty Mouse and Heckle and Jekyll. And thought, well, you know, at least it's sort of cartoony. I mean, I know Filmation's going to screw it all up. And they'll make it bland, but, you know, at least I'll get to work on some cartoony stuff. Like, none of the commercials I worked on were cartoony. So I went over to Filmation and experienced the factory system for the first time. There, everybody had a very specific job. And uh, not really much contact with people in the other departments. It's just like the opposite of how... Calico worked. It's just like the soulless factory. And the whole system was designed so that each department would basically erase what the previous department did. It was a really stupid system. So by the time um, the film made it to the screen, nobody recognized their input. Whatever you did just wasn't there. It just looked, everything looked exactly the same as if, as if one person did everything. A really bland person. And, and what was the thinking behind that? Like, was it just easier? There is no thinking. It's cheap. The thinking was cheap. Cheap, churn it out. And the people who ran it were super conservative on top of that. Like, they they seem to think that, you know, standardizing everything was cheaper. And doing a factory system was cheaper. But after I worked in each of the departments in all these Saturday morning studios for a few years, I... It started to dawn on me that, you know, just because you're using a factory system doesn't mean you have to draw bad. Just because you have less drawings than a fully animated cartoon doesn't mean the drawings themselves have to be crappy or that the individual artists can't have input. So I, I cobbled together my own version of a, a factory system that was a combination of the TV factory system and uh, the old Warner Brothers unit system for Looney Tunes and first tried that out 
on Ralph Bakshi's version of Mighty Mouse. This was like seven years after the filmation version. Uh, Ralph sold his own version of Mighty Mouse and put me in charge of setting up the whole studio, which I did, and I installed this completely different system that you know wasn't used at any of the other studios. But from the experience I had working in each of the different departments, I knew like what wasn't working in the in the uh, current system, and I knew how to. I mean, I had guesses on how I could make the departments work better together. So instead of having departments, I reinstalled the director system, the unit system from the 1930s. So uh, each director would have all the different types of artists you need to make a cartoon all within his unit. So he would follow it through from the story to the storyboard to the layout, to the animation, to the voice or direction. So the director all of a sudden had, like one person had way more control over the uh, quality of the cartoon. So that way when you watch the cartoons in Mighty Mouse, you could tell the different directors' cartoons apart. And you, not only that, you could tell the different artists' uh, scenes apart. You could tell a Mike Cazala scene from a Jim Gomez scene or a Bruce Tim scene from uh, a Ken Boyer scene. Those, those Mighty Mouses were completely unique. There was nothing, nothing at all being done like that in the whole industry. And that was the cartoon that really kicked off what they later called creator-driven cartoons. And the whole system just turned upside down. Was there a lot of resistance to it in the beginning? Like, were, were people pretty open to it? Or, or did you have to kind of fight to get that implemented? Well, Ralph was totally open to it. And uh, all the artists were totally open to it because all, all those artists were completely miserable working on Saturday morning cartoons because you had no input. You, know, you, would, you would not recognize your input when the film was finished. And everyone was embarrassed by, by the stuff we were working on. So yeah, everybody was totally into it. The network was a little wary of it. But uh, Ralph somehow t you know, used his charisma and, and talked him into basically leaving us alone. It was amazing. We hardly got any network notes. Uh, they let the artists write the stories for the first time. They let the artists direct the voices. The directors directed the voices. And normally, uh, what was happening is they'd have, each department would have its own department head, and that person would uh, be in charge of you know everything to do with their, his or her department. So, for example, the voice directors would be somebody who didn't work on the cartoon in any other aspect. All they did was direct the voices. And they'd have no idea what the story was about or anything. They'd read the script that day and then just arbitrarily tell the voice actors what to do. And these people, these voice directors, weren't creative people. They weren't, uh, they weren't artists. They weren't writers. They weren't animators. They, had no, they weren't actors. <laughs> there was somebody's secretary that was promoted to voice director. And seriously. And it's still like that in a lot of the studios. They still have these crazy department heads that have no idea how the whole film goes together or what it's about or anything. It's just a nutty system. Uh, so how, from the Mighty Mouse cartoon, then how did uh, Ren and Stimpy come into the works? Like, how long had you been working on that, and how did that come to be? Well, I've been working on Ren and Stimpy since, since I moved to L.A., pretty much. While I was at Calico was when I created them. And uh, over the years, I started writing stories and, and uh, doing storyboards of certain gags and, uh, you know, putting together, Lynn Naylor and I put together a, a presentation that I started taking around to the networks, the Saturday Morning Cartoon Networks, to pitch it. And they all rejected it. They thought it was crazy because it was so different than, uh, you know, Saturday Morning Cartoons. And uh, after Mighty Mouse, I figured uh, maybe I could pitch one of my own shows again now, now that not Mighty Mouse is well known and everybody's imitating it. So I went around again and pitched Ren and Stimpy and Hee Hog and a whole bunch of my characters. Again, got rejected everywhere. So event, uh, the year after Mighty Mouse, a Sody Clampett contacted me and said that Deke wants to make some new Beanie and Cecil's. Sody was Bob Clampett's wife. Bob Clampett's my hero. Right? So 
thought, well, yeah, this, you know, this might be cool. I mean, it's Deke, which was even a worse studio than Filmation. <laughs> it dethroned Filmation in the crap department. So, you know, I was pretty scared, and I warned Sody. I said, you know, this is Deke. This is the worst studio that, that's ever existed. They're not going to be too interested in putting any quality or life into, uh, into the show. And she said, well, that's why I want you to be the producer on it, because I know that you care about this stuff, and maybe you can push it through. So, all right. So we did Beanie and Cecil, but that was, you know, and I was able to use part of the system that I developed on Mighty Mouse, uh, but not completely. So they didn't let the artists write the stories this time around. Instead, they had this total hack, Chuck Lorre, who uh, didn't care about cartoons, didn't understand cartoons, couldn't write, wasn't funny, just this mean guy. And uh, they put him in charge of the stories, and they wrote scripts instead of writing them on storyboards. And he just was a nightmare to work with. He hated the cartoonists. He was, just, he was just there for political reasons. Really, all he wanted to do was uh, score the music on his Casio. <laughs> uh, you know, because they pay you a lot more to do the music than any other job because you get royalties and stuff. So he made a deal with the network saying, the only way I'm going to write the stories or be in charge of the stories is if you give me the music contract. And the music was completely awful. <laughs> So the whole thing turned into a political nightmare. There was too many people at the top, and the network, the network executives hated us. They hated the artists. They hated uh, the Clampets, the Clampet family. And the only person they liked was Chuck Lorre, who was making life miserable for everybody. But we were doing sto you know, funny storyboards, and we were doing the layouts in, in, uh, in-house, which uh, nobody else was doing. They didn't even know what layouts were at, at uh, Deke because they just shipped everything overseas. So they had, we, you know, we, had, we brought in animation desks. We had to have animation desks made because they didn't know what they were. They never heard of an animation desk. So when we brought them in, you know, they have a hole, you know how you have the hole in the, in the desk to put the disc in, the animation disc in. The uh, studio head looked at these desks and thought, wait a minute, we paid for these desks and there's a goddamn hole in it. <laughs> Send them back. So I saw them starting to, you know, get the movers in, and, and they were putting them in the elevators to take them out. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> These goddamn things are faulty. They have a hole in them. But I'm back. <laughs> God damn it. It's an animation desk. So they put them back, and, the, you know, the whole studio, all the artists in the studios who didn't know anything about how animation worked were all coming down to see these weird, you know, exotic desks and stuff. What are you guys doing? What's this layout business? What does this mean? So some of the cartoons actually ended up looking pretty good. They had funny drawings in them, and some of them had pretty good, well-painted backgrounds and things. The stories didn't make any sense. But uh, anyways, it all came crashing down because the network hated it right from day one. They didn't want artists to have any input. I mean, that, that's the way the studios work. Cartoonists were not supposed to have input in the cartoons. The cartoonists weren't considered the creative people. The guys who write, wrote the scripts were the creative people. The voice directors were the creative people. None of those people knew anything about animation. And cartoonists were just considered, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, evil, what do they call it? Necessary evil. <laughs> well, somebody's got to draw this crap, you know, and, and the audience... The public thinks that cartoonists make this stuff, so we got to have some damn cartoonists in here. We just won't talk to them. <laughs> yeah, it, it blows your mind the way the thinking goes. Like, you would think you would want animators to be central to everything, but yeah, it, it's completely backwards. The well, they were for the first 40 years. Right. <laughs> as they invented the whole art form and the business and everything and created the greatest characters in history, somehow it all... They got kicked out by the 60s, and Saturday morning cartoons were invented. And by the 80s, they had no say whatsoever until until Ralph and I ch turned it all around. So B and C, so you know, got canceled uh, about halfway through the series, and that was a nightmare. 
And I just wanted to quit animation after that because I couldn't believe after Mighty Mouse, after the success of Mighty Mouse, that proved that the model worked of giving cartoonists control, they would all come crashing down the next year. So I was ready to quit. I quit the whole business, me and a few friends. But instead, we decided to start an illustration studio. Well, yeah, that was quitting animation. We were going to do illustrations. And the first job we got was to design a game called, uh, it, was a, it was a game to convince, it was supposed to convince kids not to take drugs, called uh, Captain Quantum and the Ugly Druggies. <laughs> uh, so we designed all the characters and, and the board and made these really funny playing cards and stuff. And if you actually look at the game and the, and the playing cards and all the characters we created, it would probably make you want to take drugs. <laughs> And those things have become really collectible. That was the first thing Spomco ever did. But while we were doing it, uh, Carl Masick told me that he heard that Nickelodeon was thinking about starting up a Saturday morning cartoon studio, and that they were looking for pitches, but they didn't want to, they didn't want the typical standard Saturday morning type of stuff, and they didn't really want to work with the big studios. They wanted to work with young artists who believed in their own properties, who had, you know, some soul and, and, and cared about what they were doing. So that fit me. And, and uh, he set up a meeting with me and Vanessa Coffey. And I went and pitched her, uh, I don't know, geez, about seven shows in one in one sitting. And, and uh, the way, where I pitched it was uh, at, uh, she was staying at the Universal Studio Hotel. And for some reason, the air conditioning was off that day. It wasn't working. And it was about 100 degrees in there. And when I pitch, I jump around and do flips and, and all kinds of crazy stuff. I really act out all the stories, right? So I'm doing this in 100-degree weather, and I'm just covered with sweat. And every time I would shake my head or something, the sweat would fly off my hair into her face. <laughs> I'm going to sheet splash against her face. <laughs> so we were both... Uh, soaked by the end of the uh, by the end of the pitch, and Janessa and Vanessa looked up at me and said, "You know, this is the funniest stuff I've ever seen." But I, you know, I'm supposed to go back to New York tomorrow and pitch the ideas to the rest of the executives at Nickelodeon. She said, "I don't know how I can pitch this stuff. I'm going to try and get you to come out there." So she went back, told them about the pitch, and convinced them to fly me out there, which I did couple days later and then I pitched it in front of I don't know, six or seven executives who were all you know, flummoxed they didn't know what the hell was going on <laughs> Vanessa got it but none of the other ones really did until the very last pitch that I was doing when uh, Jerry Laybourne uh, who ran Nickelodeon heard all this yelling and screaming she came down and opened the door and said, what's all, what's going on in there? What's all this screaming about? <laughs> and all the ex executives looked up at her like, please save us. This is John. He's pitching shows here. And none of them wanted to make decisions because they just had never seen anything like it, right? So then, uh, Jerry said, well, do you have any pitches left? And I said, yeah, I got one left. And I pitched her story about Jimmy the Idiot Boy and his dad taking him to the uh, happiest place on earth, which turned out not to be Disneyland. It turned out to be the wilderness, because he had a real manly dad who took him, who took him out and learned to teach him how to survive in the elements. And it was, you know, it was a wild pitch and everything, and I was jumping around and screaming and stuff. And at one point, I had an asthma inhaler in my pocket, and it flew out of my pocket and hit Jerry Laborn right in the tits. <laughs> and everyone gasped in the room. They all went, like this. And I just went over there and I plucked it up between them and put it back in my pocket and went back to the pitch. So after the pitch was over, she looked at she turned, looked around the room. There was you know dead silence, and she looked at her executives and said, "Buy something from this man." <laughs> turned around and left. And that was it. Like the next day, I flew back to L.A. Vanessa called me and said, "We want to buy two shows from you: the Jimmy Show." And uh, ran Stimpy. And that's how it happened. So did the the Jimmy show ever come to be? Like, did that ever get brought No, because once I saw that they sent me the contract, and the, and the contract 
said that they, they were going to own everything. And I was basically going to get screwed out of our properties. So I thought, mm, this doesn't look good. But I want to get my stuff on the air, so I'll sell them uh, my second best show. So I sold them Ran and Stimpy. And uh, so how did it go from there? Like once you sold the show, what was the process like? Then they wanted to do a pilot first so they could do all their market research and focus testing and stuff like that. So we did a pilot called Big House Blues, which uh, we didn't send overseas to do. We animated it all in North America. Half of it we animated in L.A. at Spunko, and the other half we animated uh, at Carbuncle in uh, Vancouver. And we had it inked, like hand inked with brushes, inked and painted at Bardell Studios. So it really looked amazing, you know. It, was like, it didn't look like crappy factory stuff. It looked, it was completely hand done by really good people. So they took that, they took the, uh, the pilot when it was done, and they focus tested it. I don't know if you know what focus testing is, but it's the dumbest thing ever. It's like pseudoscience. It's where they get like a group of people in a room and show them the footage and get feedback from them, right? Yeah, and they get the dullest person. They don't let you go in and pitch it or anything because that's cheating. <laughs> they, they, you know, I wanted to go. I said, look, if you have to focus test this, at least have me introduce it and explain who the characters are. And Vanessa said, well, no, that's kind of cheating because you'll do it in an entertaining way, which will trick the kids into thinking it's going to be fun. <laughs> so instead, they get you know some kind of librarian or something, some spinster who doesn't know anything about this show, and she just stands up there and goes, "Here's a show about a chihuahua who has a psychological problem and a dumb cat, and they don't really get along, and they pick their noses." <laughs> <laughs> so you know. And then the moms are all there with the kids. And we, of course, the kids are afraid, even when they show the cartoon. They're afraid that when they ask, they like ask them crazy questions. Anyways, they did the focus testing of Brandon Stimpy, of Rog Rats, of uh, Doug, and of about five other uh, cartoon pilots that they had commissioned. So after they did that, Vanessa called me up to tell me about the results. And she sounded real kind of crestfallen, right? So, uh, you know, John, you know, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, the focus testing uh, didn't do that well on Ren and Stimpy. And I, I couldn't believe it, right? I thought, man, if you show this cartoon, the kids are going to freak out. I said, yeah, it didn't do well on the, uh, on the uh, score. Uh, so I said, well, what kind of questions did you ask the kids? She said, well, we asked uh, them... What do you think of uh, the cutting? What do you think of the, the edit? <laughs> <laughs> what, kids, kids don't know what cutting is or editing. What do you mean? And so I said, uh, well, does that mean that you're not going to pick up the series? She said, no, you know what? I'm going to go ahead, uh, go against the marks. I'm going to take a risk of my own job here because I like it. I think it's great. And Jerry Laybourne thinks it's great, too. So we're going to screw the science and just go ahead with it. I said, oh. And uh, then she said, and there was one area where you actually did better than everyone else, than all the other cartoons and all the other questions. I said, really? Well, what area was that? She said, well, the kids laughed more at yours. <laughs> and that's not really a question, but I'm going to go with my gut instinct. <laughs> no one thought to ask that. Like, or no. talk to the pay attention to the laughing. Did you think it was funny? No, but they were just all laughing. <laughs> really? She said, yeah, they were laughing nonstop all through it, even though they didn't approve of the cutting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like, how did it go from there? I mean, I know you, you ended up doing two seasons, and, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you, what ha like, you ended up not finishing out the second season, right? Uh, yeah, you know, that story has been written about and talked about a million times. Basically, they wanted to start their own studio, and Ren and Simpy was so successful in making them so much money that they figured halfway through the second season, hey, we could start our own series, our own studio like this, and not only do Ren and Simpy, but do a whole bunch of other cartoons. And then we could, you know, completely control the 
the uh, artists. We don't have to put up with their crap. And that's what they did halfway through it. They uh, decided to show up with a big van and take all the stuff out of out of our studio, put it in their studio. And that was it. That was the beginning of uh, the Nickelodeon cartoon studio. They called it Games at the time. So uh, moving forward, like how tough was it to? Uh, were they pretty uh, George Licker? Like were they open to letting you have the character back, or how tough was it to be able to get to use him? Well, they hated George Licker. Even though he was a main character in Rand Stimpy, he was their master. They hated him from, from day one. I don't know why, but uh, they did. I think they hated him because he was a Republican. <laughs> um, so the first season, they didn't even let me really use him. They, you know, they, actually, they let us do a storyboard uh, based on a story that I pitched with Jimmy, where his dad takes him to the wilderness. I just replaced Jimmy and the dad with George Lecker and Ren and Stimpy, and I had George take them out to the wilderness uh, to learn how to survive, get back to our, uh, you know, get back to our roots, live like the cavemen. And it was a really funny storyboard. Jim Smith drew it. It was a great storyboard. But it got rejected. They looked at it and they said, oh, we can't do this. We hate this guy. So after the first season was over and it was really successful, um, I met with them during the summer for lunch in New York. And, uh, you know, they tell me how much they loved the show and they were so happy with uh, how successful it is and everything. I said, well, you know, does that mean now you'll trust me a little bit more with some of the stories that I come up with that you're not sure about? And I reminded them that they hated Space Madness and Cindy's Invention, <laughs> which were the two most popular episodes. So they said, uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, we trust you, John. He says, well, okay, can I do those George Licker stories now? And they were like, uh, George, I said, come on, remember Stimpy's invention. You, you, you almost rejected the whole thing. And look how popular it is. So they reluctantly said, yeah, okay. And we did a couple of George Licker cartoons. They still didn't let me do Willer's Adventure, which was the funniest one. But we did um, Dog Show, where George takes him... Um, you know, to, uh, to a dog show. And we did Man's Best Friend, which was kind of an origin story where George buys them at a pet store and takes them home and teaches them love through discipline. And that one, even though they approved it and let us animate it, when they saw it, they were just shocked. I don't know why they were shocked, because it was everything in the film was in the storyboard. It looked exactly like the storyboard, except it's animated. But they saw it, and they decided they weren't going to inherit it. And uh, they used that as an excuse to stop paying us. And that's when they took over the show. And when and after they took over the show, of course, they'd have to you know sign a contract. We'd have to renegotiate the contract to get me out of there and stuff, get Spunko out of it. And as one of the negotiating things, I said, we, you, you know, can I have George Licker back? And they didn't want to give them back to me. I said, why don't you want to give them back? You're not going to use them. And they were afraid that I was going to uh, do cartoons, that I was going to make George into a mass murderer. Uh, they thought it was like, you know, it's weird. They think Republicans are, are mass murderers and psychopaths. I said, you know, he's, not, he's just a, he's like a dad. He's not, <laughs> I'm not going to do mass murder stories with George Licker just because he's in the military. Let's make him a mass murderer. He's protecting our country and our freedoms. Your freedom to be a big damn hippie. <laughs> Wasn't for George Licker, he couldn't be a fucking hippie. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> how how long is the the cans without labels? Like, how long has this project been in the works? About four years. Uh, about four years ago. Um, Ryan Carell at Leo Burnett asked me to uh, do a series on the internet with a direct sponsor and he found Pontiac Pontiac was going to sponsor the show and we made the deal we were going to do, we were going to do 10 episodes online of George Decker and one of them was Cans Without Labels 
so we started it in production, as we did with a few other Pontiac cartoons. And uh, about halfway through the production, the recession happened, the, the big crash happened with the banks and stuff. So uh, Pontiac went out of business <laughs> as part of that. <laughs> you know, GM closed a bunch of its uh, brands or whatever, and Pontiac was one of them. So that was the end of that. So I have all these storyboards and stories done for a whole bunch of George Liquor stories. And that was one that was the most developed because all the layouts were drawn already in pencil traditionally. So, uh, you know, when we, we, we were, a couple of months ago, we were thinking about, you know, maybe we should try this Kickstarter thing. Because some artist friends of mine were doing things without any network interference and they end up owning the projects. So I thought, you know, that's for me. Now, which project should we go with? And then I remembered that I had Cans Without Labels. It was pretty far along in production. Let's do that one. So, we, you know, we had no idea how to do the Kickstarter thing or anything. We figured it out over a weekend, and we put it up. And it's, it's all trial and error. You know, you're kind of learning day by day what, 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 what works and what doesn't. But you have constant contact with the audience, which you don't in Saturday morning cartoons. You have to make the cartoon, and then when it's done, you get the reaction. But by the time it gets to the audience, the networks have messed it up so badly that it's not even something that you you think the audience would like. So this completely eliminates all those problems. Crowdfunding is, is unbelievable. It's a, it's a great model. Are you just dealing directly with the audience? And, you know, it's up to you to make something work or not. If they don't like it, they won't fund your next one. So what is much more efficient model than than what we have in the in the corporate world? So uh, I mean, obviously you're you're still trying to figure everything out, but where where do you see this going? Like, do you want to put George Liquor cartoons online? Would you just sell them directly to people through Kickstarter? Like, what is kind of the thinking for you going forward? Well, here's the thing. I mean, with the internet, no matter no matter who you make the cartoon for. What you make, whether you make a movie or whether you make a TV show, it all ends up on YouTube anyways. There's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well just do it. Directly. It's almost no point putting it on TV. You might as well just give it directly to the audience, the people who paid for it. And someone there is going to put it on YouTube anyways, and then the whole world will see it. <laughs> so is, this, is it like a 22-minute cartoon, or how long is the Cans Without Labels? It's about the length of a Ren and Snippy cartoon, probably about 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So is this all going to be, is it all hand-drawn um, in Spumco? Like, are you guys doing the animation, or does it still get shipped over somewhere? Not shipping it anywhere. Um, I do most of the animation now, because it's only one short. If it was 13 half hours, I wouldn't be able to uh, do that, obviously. Then you kind of have to send it overseas we always hate doing but it's just the practical reality of doing that much footage and with the lousy budgets they give you on TV but in this case I'll be the main animator I have a few people that have been training not only here but they're see here's the other good thing um, there are artists who are fans of mine around the world who practice my style in the same way that I practiced Hanna Barbera style and, and uh, Warner Brothers style when I was a kid, so they already are people that would fit in this Spumco style, right? And not everybody does. I mean, different artists gravitate towards different styles. But when you're doing the overseas thing, if you're sending stuff to Korea, you don't get people who are specifically right for your show. You just get whoever is in line to pick up a scene. So somebody who worked on Batman one day is doing Ren and Stimpy the next day, and then they're doing the Smurfs the next day so they're not good at any styles and it forces them to just trace model sheets because it's, it's not like they're really into the show and they're, and they're going to design custom poses and expressions that fit the story I mean they don't speak English either it's just a, a terrible system but in this way I can work with whoever I want around the world with the internet and it's you know it's a lot of people in the Netherlands I've got David De Rouge Harmke Pastor Camp Mitch Louie you know, the people in Canada who already draw kind of in my style or in a style that's complementary to uh, to my cartoons. So you can kind of handpick your crew now. You have the whole world 
you have access to the whole world instead of just whoever's in in your city. So what? Uh, I think I think all these elements now are coming together to possibly uh, maybe cause another uh, animation renaissance. I hope. I mean, people say that all the time, but hopefully, all the elements are there with the internet and with the new software you can use. So yeah, what what do you think the future holds uh, for you and for your studio? Well, who knows? Every time I try to predict specifically what's going to happen, it never comes true. And I was predicting this stuff in 1996 when we did our first uh, Internet cartoons, the George Licker program. But the business never caught on. It was really dumb because what I wanted to do for the longest time was go back to direct sponsorship, with the, which they used to do on the radio and on television, where a sponsor would team up with uh, an entertainer like Jello teamed up with uh, Jack Benny right and they would go to the they would go to the network whatever network it was and they'd say the sponsors say I'm going to pay for this show and you're going to put it on but in return I get to have Jack Benny and Rochester and, and uh, Don Wilson and, and the cast pitch my products so they'll do Jello commercials in the show oh, that's a great model it's a very simple model right that means that the commercials are going to be really entertaining which they were in the old TV shows. They're as entertaining as the show itself because the performers are doing the commercials and their team of writers is writing the commercials. So if they were doing that today, nobody would want to fast forward to commercials. On TV now, nobody even needs to watch commercials anymore because of TiVo and stuff. So it's a huge crisis for, for sponsors. And they waste a ton of money, I think, on ad agencies and stuff who who are determined to make commercials that you hate, that you'll never want to watch, and you, and you want to fast forward to. So, you know, I've had the solution for 15 years. Give the sponsors and the creators and the audience the control back. So it's a nice three-way uh, partnership. But the business community has not figured it out. I mean, this was available 12 years ago when we were doing our first, our first uh, internet commercials. I mean, internet cartoons. But the business community has not caught up with the concept yet. It's crazy. So then when Kickstarter came along and Indiegogo and stuff, they figured out, well, just just have the audience find the uh, entertainment themselves. So it's kind of solved that problem, at least partially. Uh, what do you think you'd do for a living if you never got into animation? Oh, I'd be a bomb. <laughs> Standing on a street corner pretending I'm a veteran. <laughs> um, tell me something that uh, most people don't know about you. <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> I don't know. Did I tap dance? Do you really tap dance? Did I, I tap dance, I yodel, uh, you know, do some weird stuff for fun. Um... Well, that's uh, that's everything I had for you. Um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Well, thank you, Joe. It takes a whole lot of liquor to like her. It's why I drink all the time.